Well, hello and welcome to our first uh, sort of official lecture of the quarter. So um, this is the first lecture that we will be looking at some art. So we're going to be starting at Rome's founding at the very beginning, and we'll be looking at some of the influences from other cultures around it on its own culture. Today we're going to be looking at the Etruscans in particular, and then next week we'll be looking at the Greeks. You will hear some references to the Greeks in this lecture, um, but they'll, they'll be getting sort of their own show next week. We're also going to be looking at the regal period of Rome, so that is its first period when it was ruled by kings prior to the Republic, and we'll be looking a little bit about how Rome was founded. So to start us off, let's look at some geography. So we have Italy there on the left, and then we've sort of zoomed in to Tuscany, which is where the Etruscans were located. Uh, if you look closely, so you can see that Rome is here, and then if you've been to Italy, if you're familiar with Italy, you can see that Florence is up there, so that might help sort of situate you. Um, something I want to note is that the the western side of Italy, you might notice, is a lot more populated than the eastern side, at least in this time period. And that is primarily because the western half of uh, Italy is quite fertile. So it has a lot of fertile soil, it has a lot of rivers running through it, whereas the eastern side is a bit more rocky and not as good for settlements. So in this time period, it was just more advantageous to uh, build on the, or to settle on the west half on the western coast, and so that's why we see sort of the group that we do here. Something else I want to note is that if you look at this, um, if you look at the Etruscans compared to Rome um, in Latium, which is the, the, the area that Rome is located in, um, if I had to, to ask you <laughs> without any other knowledge of the era, which one you thought would become a massive empire, um, I think it's pretty likely that you would say the Etruscans rather than the Romans, um, because Rome is really kind of on its own down there, and the Etruscans, it's it's such a more, a more full area. I want to note that the Etruscans were not a super unified group. They were not sort of one people. They were a conglomeration of city-states, so they didn't have one ruler, but they did have a shared culture, so they had a shared language, shared religion, and um, that sort of was the crux of their unity. And that was the fact that there was this sort of unified culture is why Rome being just south of them was so influenced by that. Um, also, I wanna point out the dates here. So uh, the Etruscans were founded a bit earlier than, than Rome, um, but the art that we'll be looking at here is mainly from um, when they coexisted just because there's not a lot left from 900 BCE. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But I do wanna start in Rome since this is a course on Rome. So I want to talk about Rome's founding. Um, and so to do so, I want to talk about a story told by Livy. So Livy was a Roman historian living in the first century BC. He wrote Ab Urbe Condita, which means from the founding of the city. And it was a history of Rome from the very beginning up until his lifetime. And he tells a lot of stories, um, which may or may not be true <laughs> as part of Rome's history in that book. But one of them is the story of Romulus and Remus, who are the founders of Rome or who, who are said to be the founders of Rome. So the story goes a little bit something like this. Um, there were, uh, at the time, there was sort of settlements around, but Rome did not exist. And their grandfather was the king of one of these other towns. He was pushed out of power by his brother, and um, the brother sent the, the king's daughter. Uh, in, he made her become a, a vestal virgin, which is sort of a priestess, um, a little anach anachronistic because there's not really evidence that vestal virgins existed that far back, but Livy, writing from the first century, sort of has that mindset. But in any case, she was sort of forced to become a virgin, not marry, um, but then she gets pregnant with twins. And she says that it, she became pregnant by the god Mars, who was the god of war. And Livy even is not sure if that is the case. Um, but he notes that you don't want to be wrong because you don't want to anger the god of war if you don't believe her and then it's true. So um, he says that. Um, so the twins, because you know she's not supposed to have kids, she abandons the twins um, and sends them down a river. Uh, down the river, they are found by a wolf, a she-wolf, who nurses them and kind of becomes their, their um, adoptive mother. So that wolf you can see here in this, in this sculpture. Um, this sculpture is the sort of provenance of it is a little murky. So for a long, long time, um, it was thought to be from 500, 480 BC. Um, so it was thought to be an, an early Roman sculpture. But we're now thinking based on some um, 
scientific analysis of the bronze itself that this may be a medieval creation actually. So the twins are pretty much uh, guaranteed to be 15th century. They're definitely Renaissance creations, but the wolf was thought to be Roman, um, actually, and specifically Etruscan. So the wolf is a symbol of Etruria. Um, and Winkelmann, who we talked about in the first lecture, who wrote sort of the first history, the first art history of um, ancient art, thought that this was an Etruscan bronze. And we have actually a lot of ancient sources. So people like Livy and other people in his time who talk about seeing a um, a sculpture of a wolf in the forum at the base of the Palatine Hill in the middle of Rome. And so there was a lot of thought that maybe this statue that we still have could be that statue that they were talking about. And then Winkelmann pointed to a couple things that may have um, marked it as an Etruscan sort of design. But uh, in the early 20th, 21st century, some scientists did analysis on it and they believe that the bronze actually came from the medieval era and that this is actually more of a work of Roman reception. Um, but like I said, there was a sort of famous statue of a wolf that did stand in Rome. So even if it wasn't this one in particular, sort of the idea is still there. Um, but yeah, for a long time, people did think this was an ancient work. And so just to look at it for a second, it's a, it's a 360 composition. It can be viewed from all angles. Um, the wolf is quite static, so it sort of just turns its head. There's not a lot of movement there. Um, the body proportions are a little off, like its neck is very long, um, not super realistic in that sense. And also the beading on the fur, um, not super realistic, more patterned, kind of an abstracted pattern on it. Um, so you can see why, uh, or at least you will see maybe later on, why this was thought to be an Etruscan work. Um, and there's still debate about it. We are not really sure it looks like it's leaning toward medieval but even if it was medieval it's possible that it was copying um an earlier work so there we are um just to finish off the myth for you so the boys are raised by the wolf until they are found by a shepherd's wife who takes them in and they are then raised by the shepherd and his wife um, when they grow to adulthood they decide to uh, overthrow their their great uncle who took over um from their from their grandfather they do that um they restore uh, their their uh, grandfather to power, and then they decide that they want their own city. They're ready to break free on their own. So um, they come to Rome. So they come to this bend of the Tiber River where they have um, sort of identified as a good place to, to build their new city. But the issue um, is that they need to decide exactly where to build there. And Rome is built on seven hills. So the seven hills of Rome are something that you might hear about a lot. And here you are, that you can see them there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> um, and there's a debate between the brothers. So Romulus wants to build the city on the Palatine Hill and his brother Remus wants to build it on the Aventine Hill. And um, in order to settle this debate, because they can't agree among themselves, they decide to ask the gods for a sign about who is correct. And they do so through something called an auspice. So that is a divine sign by birds. <laughs> and what you do is you go to the top of a hill and you look up into the sky and based on how the birds are flying in the quadrants of the sky, that will tell you um, what the gods are thinking. So whoever sees the the, num the birds first, or there's sort of uh, different interpretations of it. And the person who identifies this is called an auger, and that is important later on. So they go to the top of the hill, they look for the birds, they still can't decide. Remus thinks that the gods are telling him to build on the Aventine Hill. Romulus thinks the gods are telling him to build on the Palatine Hill. An argument breaks out, a fight between their two sides, and Remus is killed. And that's the exact wording from Libby. Um, he doesn't say who killed Remus, so it's a bit murky if it was Romulus or just one of his supporters. But nonetheless, Remus is killed and Romulus becomes the king, the first king of Rome. And he decides to build on the Palatine Hill. So, um, uh, this is all said to take place in 753. That's the date that Livy gives us. Whether or not that is true, we really don't know. I mean, we have no reason to believe or not believe that, except that we do have ruins on the Palatine Hill from the eighth century. And so uh, this is the so-called House of Romulus. It is on the Palatine Hill. You can see it today. It's some, the archeologists have excavated there. And this is evidence of dwellings at the Palatine Hill. Um, so, uh, there maybe is some truth to the myth, right? <laughs> um, and uh, generally that is sort of what we do in history or art history. If we have no reason to not believe someone giving a date like that, we generally take their word for it because 
although Livy was living long after this, um, he was living a lot closer than we are, and it was part of his culture. And so if there's no direct evidence to contradict it, we sort of take the text at face value. And here we actually do have some archeological evidence as well. So it creates a pretty strong um, uh, evidence that uh, even if it wasn't exactly 753, Rome was founded around this time. And actually he gives us an exact date, it's April 21st, 753. So you can mark your calendars and celebrate on that day if you want. <laughs> um, so uh, these are the yeah, houses that would have been uh, in early Rome. They are actually built from the bedrock, so the tufa rock, that was sort of the best way to do it. So they would carve a foundation out of the natural rock that the Palatine Hill is made out of, and then um, create a rectangular plan with these kind of rounded corners. And then they would install posts, wooden po posts, sort of uh, to make a, a substructure. And then they would cover that with a mud plaster. And here's a little bit of a better picture for you. So this is what these houses would have looked like. Um, you can see that they're sort of uh, loosely rectangular, but with rounded corners. So sort of not quite rectangular, but not quite ovular. Um, they would have had a, a, a mud uh, mud walls, as I said, sort of a mud plaster around wood. Um, this is called the wattle and daub, wattle and daub uh, technique where you, <laughs> where you do that. And then there's the thatched roof also made of timber. Um, so what we're looking at here is actually an urn. So um, at Rome's founding, what we know as the Forum today, it was actually not the Forum, but it was their necropolis. And necropolis is a big buzzword of this lecture. So um, the necropolis is a cemetery. And so that is where people were buried. They were buried around what is today the Roman Forum. And um, this was found in that cemetery. So it is an urn that would have held ashes. And we actually see this a lot in the Etruscan um, civilization and around Rome. Uh, you see these house urns, these urns for ashes that look like houses. And you know we can compare to the archeological evidence and see that this is actually what houses generally would have looked like at this time. So it's kind of cool. It's a cool piece of evidence. Um, yeah, so like I said, a wattle and daub method. Um, the houses also would have been a bit longer on one side, as I said, rectangular with that door at the short end. And this is really interesting too, because when we get to later Rome, you'll see that uh, it sort of mimics the same pattern. So this same idea of having that short door at the end and then a long rectangular. Um, so the house is sort of a, a, a situated along a, a long axis. Um, here we just have one room, but we'll see other rooms as well later on. Um, this was sort of uh, the beginnings of the same house structure. So it's interesting to see how, um, you know, we go from the beginnings to more complex houses later on. Um, it's also important because it uh, represents the two kind of topics for today, um, our main pieces of evidence from the Etruscan culture, which are grave goods and graves and uh, urban layout. So those are the two big things that we're gonna be looking at um, when we look at how Etruscan civilization influenced Rome um, the, 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 those aren't the only two ways that the Etruscans influenced them, but in order to learn how the Etruscans influenced them, we're going to look at grave goods and urban layout. Um, also there you have a little map um, of early Rome. So you can see the Palatine Hill is right here. And then um, the uh, this is Forum Necropolis. So that's where this, uh, approximately where this um, urn was found. And then we'll, we'll kind of come back to this later on. Um, so first, I want to start with urban layout. Um, so this is the Etruscan city of Marzabato. Um, you can see it, it's way up north here and it was a little bit later, so 5th century BC. Um, you can see this is, um, we have, we don't have a lot of archaeological evidence of complete Etruscan towns because, uh, well, honestly, because a lot of them are lower. So when you dig in archaeology, you have layers, right? And the oldest layers are at the bottom. Um, and there's so much other rich archaeology in Italy that a lot of times we haven't just gotten quite to those layers yet, if ever, or, you know, they don't want to destroy what's on top. So we might not ever see what's down there. Um, or they've currently been built over into other cities. So um, a lot of them have been unexcavated and maybe will never be excavated, but this is one that has. So Marzipoto, um, you can see that it's on a fairly regular grid plan. So we have straight streets, and things lining those streets, um, separate areas for residential, religious, commercial buildings, and really important, especially for this uh, lecture, is the necropoli. necropoli. So uh, you have the north, east, the necropoli would have been around the edge of the city, and this is something that is classic Roman as well. Um, the dead were never buried in the city. They were always buried outside the city um, on the outskirts, which kind of makes sense maybe just for um, 
I don't know, hygiene or I don't know, peace of mind um, that you don't want to bury your dead in the middle of the city. So we put them on the outside. Um, and the word necropolis literally means city of the dead. So polis is uh, the Greek word for city and then necro is a root meaning dead or, or death. Um, and so these are literal cities of the dead as we will see. Um, so this is the first um, or the really the biggest necropoli necropolis that we have in Servitary. Um, and you can see that on the map. Oh, where did it go? I just had it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually pretty close to Rome. You can see it's not, not too far. Um, and this was in use from the seventh to second centuries BC, so a pretty long time. So another thing worth mentioning is that when Rome was founded, the Etruscans did not stop. Um, their culture continued. Um, so the necropoli were set up actually like little cities. Um, so it's funny that they're called cities of the dead because that, that's really accurate. They looked like cities, especially this one um, had had streets, it had gutters, and the way that the tombs lined the streets were sort of the way that houses might line a street in a city. Um, so these tombs, you can see them here, this is a nice aerial view. Here's a little bit better look at them. So these tombs are called tumuli, singular tumulus. Um, and these are the tombs that you would find in an Etruscan necropolis. This is, this is standard Etruscan tombs. Um, they are beehive shaped tombs made of natural stone with dirt piled on top and then they have a rectangular opening. Um, and each of these tumuli contains multiple tombs. Um, so you'd walk in and then there would sort of be passageways to different rooms um, that were different tombs that round. And <laughs> so uh, the way that they were set up also is kind of like a house. So in that sense that you have, um, and you can see them here, um, long, these long axis, and then rooms off to the side, that is sort of mimicking how the houses were built. So these tombs are houses of the dead, basically, and they're located in cities of the dead. Um, so that's one way that we can uh, learn more about Etruscan and Roman early towns is from these necropoli, um, which sort of resemble what the actual towns would have been like. So we're gonna look at a few of the tombs from this necropolis. Um, oh, one thing that I wanted to mention, that's right, uh, is that these tombs were subterranean. So um, you would, uh, sometimes they were above level, like in the like in that one, I think that the, the was showing is it had some on the ground level, um, but most of the time they would be underground, especially um, for considerations of space. Right, so the more people that you need to bury, the more space you need, so they started going underground. So here's a look at what that would look like um, if you're walking down the steps into this rectangular opening and then the picture on the right is actually like once you've gotten to the bottom of the steps, right, so it's really dark, really looks like a tomb. Um, and here's a better look at the layout. Um, so we have that long axis, right, and then we have rooms off to either side. Um, Oh, I should also note that the fact that they're underground is sort of a reference to Roman religion. So, um, um, so the fact that they're underground, uh, Roman religion, um, the world of the dead, right? So their sort of idea of the afterlife was the underworld. And so the fact that they're underground is also um, sort of a, a, a reference to that as well. Um, it's a literal underground, a literal underworld. Um, and we'll see more references to that in the art itself. Um, so you can see that the tombs really did resemble um, houses. I mean, yes, they're underground, which houses wouldn't have been, but the fact that they have furniture, um, again, pointing to sort of their similarities. The roof also, the beams that are like that are similar to um, how it would have looked inside one of those wattle and daub huts. So um, here we have chairs that are sort of built in, they're made from the natural stone. Um, in this one, uh, the Tomb of the Shields and Chairs, it is likely for someone who is an elite member of society. So those, those shields on the walls um, probably indicate that it was a warrior. And then the fact that these chairs are so grand that they almost look a little bit like thrones probably points to the, that this was um, an elite member of society who was buried here. And if you look in the very back um, right here, you can see beds, also another reference, like we are in a house. Um, and that is where the, the dead would have been laid or um, a lot of times they were cremated and so maybe they would be placed inside those. Um, and the Tomb of the Five Chairs, <laughs> another um, reference to sort of domestic dwelling, both at Servitary. Um, so as I said, they were sometimes buried in those beds, um, but other times and perhaps more often in sarcophagi. So sarcophagi are stone coffins um, that would have held the dead. So, uh, 
here is perhaps the most famous of all of the Etruscan sarcophagi, um, and there are many that we have. It's called the Sarcophagus of the Spouses. It's from 520 BC, um, and it is terracotta, quite large, as you can see, um, six feet long. And uh, there's an almost identical version in the Louvre, so you'll start to see um, that there's a lot of similarities between, we have a lot of sarcophagi, and they almost used similar um, styles, like it was maybe even the same workshop, something like that, because it was the one in the Louvre is from the same uh, necropolis. Um, so we sort of see sort of these, these like standardized forms of sarcophagi. Um, it's a terracotta sarcoph sarcophagus, so that means that it's baked clay. Um, it's sort of made the same way that like a pot would be made, that pottery would be made. Uh, also the um, the couple, so we see a, reclin a reclining couple here, a man and a woman, um, and it's a, a they're kind of looking out in different directions into space and they're quite abstracted. So they're not super realistic. Um, you can see their hair is sort of these thin um, plates. Um, they are trying to kind of be expressive, but it's it, it still feels somewhat static. Um, and their position too is, although they're reclining, it's a little unnatural. If you look at the woman's waist and her legs, they kind of just disappear here. Um, if you look at their faces though, um, like I said, those um, sort of abstracted uh, expressions. If you have taken any classes on Greek art, you will recognize this as the archaic style. And if you look at the time period, it's actually the same time period. So um, although the Etruscans influenced the Romans, the Etruscans themselves were also influenced by the Greeks. So really these three cultures were living together, sort of uh, trading together, communicating for sure. We see a lot of overlap between them. Um, so their hair, I mentioned, is one of the things that really abstracted into these sort of um, uh, like patterned braids, um, the very pointy chin on the man, uh, the almond shaped eyes, they're very just like perfect almonds. Um, and the biggest thing is the archaic smile. So their little, their little like smile, <laughs> um, you can see is, uh, that's sort of what marks it as archaic art is if they have um, that sort of smile. And here are a couple comparisons from uh, Athens and from Cyprus. Um, yeah, a couple other ways. So the Etruscans also uh, were known to use the Greek alphabet. Uh, we have evidence of trade with Greece, Corinth in particular, um, and we see migration of craftsmen between the two. So definitely a lot of overlap between these cultures. Um, and we move forward, just talking more about sort of the abstraction. Um, so you can say that it's abstracted, right? That means it's not super realistic. That means that it's more um, reliant on shapes. So we have shape, shaped forms rather than sort of realistic, more organic forms. Um, it's, we would say these are not naturalistic, they are not realistic, um, but more abstracted. Here's another evidence, a piece of evidence of that, their feet. Um, the feet actually, the, you know, the toes don't look too bad here. Those look a little bit more realistic, um, but the bottom of them is very flat. And these, the woman is actually, she's, so she's wearing shoes. Those are not her feet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she's wearing shoes, which is kind of interesting because we can see um, sort of uh, the fashion at the time, right? So maybe what a woman would have worn. I love pieces of evidence like that because I think they show us a lot about daily life. So you kind of get an insight into what people might have been wearing every day. Um, but the feet, the toes kind of are very flat on the man. Um, and then also, yeah, so I talked about the movement a little bit, their hand positions, although there is movement, which you really don't see in archaic art in Greece, you see a lot of just the koros, which is very, um, actually more Egyptian looking, um, but it's very static. They're very just standing um, very still. We do see a more relaxed sense of movement here, um, but it's not quite natural still, like, like the hands are kind of, I don't know, they're kind of uh, contorted in my opinion. Um, but this is another a great shot of the hair as well. Um, uh, yeah, the facial shots. Um, yeah, and about the movement, that's right. So the fact that this is a bit more dynamic and expressive than um, Greek art might be does, uh, it could be a stylistic choice, but it also might be reliant on the material. So the fact that this is painted terracotta, so again, I said that's like pottery, it's a lot more tensile, you can do a lot more with it. Um, as opposed to stone, which is what the Greeks were building out of, uh, it's just, it's much more difficult to carve into sort of dynamic shapes like this. So the material might have um, something to do with that. And we see a lot of terracotta in Etruscan art. Uh, their pose also, one last thing to mention, it's a very kind of intimate pose, right? So we can infer that this is probably a married couple um, and they had this uh, sarcophagus, sarcophagus built for maybe both of them, it would have been in a shared tomb. Um, and so they're carrying that relationship into the afterlife, which is kind of romantic. Um, 
A couple more um, depictions of this sort of same theme. This is something you see a lot in Etruscan art, the idea of like a married couple um, together. And we see it in different forms um, or just even also the a reclining figure on a sarcophagus. Um, maybe perhaps, you know, when you're reclining, you're lying down, it's kind of like being dead. <laughs> um, so yes, the reclining couple that we have, um, we have a woman who's reclining on her own. So maybe um, there's no man with her. So either maybe she wasn't married, maybe she died a lot earlier than her husband or vice versa. Um, the one that we have in the middle from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, this, um, this Etruscan lid um, is much more intimate. And you can notice that that is from 300 to 350 BC. So we're getting um, a little bit later now than our sarcophagus of the couples and the figures start to look more classical. So we see more Greek classical influence there. Um, it's more intimate scene. They sort of look like they're in bed and they're embracing each other. And then the last one is not a married couple, um, also from the fourth century. So a little bit later, and we start to see more of a recognition of um, the melancholic aspects of death. So they're not doing the archaic smile and even it's not a very intimate pose. They don't look like they're just kind of hanging out. Um, this is actually a, a youth who has died, a male youth and a female demon. So um, she is sort of um, bringing him into the afterlife. She's sort of a symbol of death and they look, um, you know, very melancholic because it's, it's sort of a different um, perhaps relationship that we have with death at this point or that we want to depict. Um, so although we don't have, um, we, we do have exact, uh, sorry, we do have exact copies, as I said, in the Louvre of the sarcophagus of the, of the spouses, but we also see variations on that, especially throughout time. But the general idea of sort of a man and woman or people reclining on a sarcophagus is a common theme. We're going to move now to the actual um, tombs, so tomb designs. Um, so the first one that I want to look at is the Tomb of the Reliefs. It's in that same necropolis in Cervateri, um, and it's kind of fun. So um, it's carved from bedrock, so it is a subterranean tomb. Um, we actually know who was buried here. Uh, we know the family, at least. It was, uh, you know, multiple people were buried in one tomb, and usually by family. So there's actually an inscription. Um, it's the Matunas family, so we know who was buried there. But the really cool thing about this um, is that it features all of these cool reliefs, and that's why it's called the Tomb of the Reliefs. Uh, and a lot of them are household objects. So you can see uh, a hammer here, a knife, uh, sort of a vase. Um, other things are armor. We see drinking equipment. Um, and basically, it's kind of pointing to if we had just, say you owned this, say it was your house, right? And you just held a bank, a banquet or a drinking party, all the guests have gone home and everything that was used for that banquet, you hung up on the wall <laughs> as sort of decoration. And so that's what we're seeing here. It's almost like the remnants of a banquet that have now been hung up on the wall. Um, and if you look in the back also, you can see um, these sort of uh, uh, cushions and those um, are cleanae. So, Cleaning. So uh, this would be a triclinium or a dining room. So that, that's a, a Roman dining room is called a triclinium and tri meaning three and then cleanae or clinia meaning couch. So um, we have these, these dining couches. That's what a, a common dining room would look like even if, if you go further into the Roman period. Um, and here we see the same thing. So we have all the sort of dining banquet equipment on the walls. And then we also even have built in these um, and couches, but the couches are where the dead would have been buried. So um, there's a really cool video that walks you through this and you can see it in more detail. So I put the YouTube link up there um, and I encourage you to check that out. Uh, it's like a short three minute video, but you really feel like you're inside it and it's really cool. Um, so I also wanted to mention the uh, column capitals and column reliefs. So they're not real columns, but they're sort of made to look like it. They're more like pilasters. We see them carved into that. Um, so again, trying to make this feel like a home, um, but it's a home of the dead. And one reason that we really know this is not a real home, it is a home of the dead, is because of this relief that's in the very back. Um, so if we go back, we're looking right here, right in the center. Um, and this is uh, definitely a sign that we are not in a real house, that we are in a house of, of the dead. Um, we have a figure here who has these um, serpent-like tails for legs. Um, he's, he's an anguiped. So you can tell your friends you learned a new word today. Anguiped means someone who has tails for legs, like serpent tails for legs. 
So he is, uh, he's there and there is next to him this monster, which is a three-headed dog. And if you have watched or read Harry Potter, you know about Cerberus, who is the three-headed dog who guards the gate to the underworld. So uh, these are symbols of the underworld, essentially, um, these monsters that uh, are maybe guarding the entrance in particular. And so it's sort of representing that transition into death and um, marking this as a house of the dead. 